In this video, I want to go over a few things in chapter 16 on the endocrine system. One of the first things you'll see here on this slide is um, a representation of 10 of the most, um, some of the most important endocrine organs and glands and tissues. We'll talk about most of these in uh, another video towards the end of the chapter. We'll talk about each one of these and the hormones and chemicals that they produce. And we'll also be going over many of these in lab as well. So uh, just to begin with, um, section one gives you an overview of the endocrine system, and um, it's a good point here to note the reason why it is called the endocrine system. And uh, you may remember back in 168 when you're talking about different types of glands, there's actually two categories of glands, an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. And so the name for the endocrine system comes because we're dealing with endocrine glands. Now, I've given you the, um, the basic distinctions between the two glands here. If you remember from 168, an exocrine gland basically is defined because it has some kind of duct. It has a, a passageway uh, a, um, that allows it to secrete some type of you know, substance. Um, sometimes it's to the surface of the body, such as a sweat gland, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, for example, the pancreas, which we'll talk about, is an organ that works as an exocrine organ because it secretes enzymes uh, through a duct over into the small intestines. And then uh, most of your exocrine gland glands are multicellular, although there are some that are, are smaller than that, unicellular. Endocrine glands, uh, by definition, they don't have ducts, and so they secrete their uh, substances, their chemicals, uh, directly into the bloodstream. So it's based on diffusion. So the chemicals diffuse directly to the bloodstream, and that's really the target or the, um, the focus of this chapter. And some examples of endocrine glands that we'll look at is a thyroid thymus pituitary. The other thing that uh, this chapter does is to compare uh, and contrast um, both the nervous system and the endocrine system. So in 168, you end up talking about the nervous system at the end. And so, uh, so that should be fresh on your mind. And so now let's uh, look to see how the nervous system and endocrine systems are similar. And there's probably other ways that you could compare these. But for example, number one, both systems um, have some associati association with the brain. And that connection stems from the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus for the nervous system is an important control region of the brain, but it also uh, produces some chemicals, some hormones that we'll be talking about that um, really uh, drive a lot of what's going on for the endocrine system. And then uh, number two, this is just a general comparison here that each system, both nervous system and endocrine system, uses some type of chemical. This is called a chemical messenger. Uh, in order to relay information or communication. Now you can also think about how these two systems are different. And so I've listed out for you three major differences, three main differences between each of these systems. Number one is how that chemical is transported. So the mode of transport is different for the nervous system. You probably remember talking about neurotransmitters and um, maybe something like acetylcholine, and that gets secreted directly into a junction called a synapse. Um, that's different for endocrine system because that uses chemicals known as hormones that go directly to the bloodstream and then they travel throughout the bloodstream. Number two is the speed of the response. You can think of the nervous system as much faster. In fact, um, because it operates in uh, milliseconds, um, that's milli, the prefix milli means a thousand. So you can think of the nervous system uh, speed as being a thousand times faster than the endocrine system. Like how, how quickly is there a response? The nervous system is much faster than an endocrine system, although endocrine hormones are relatively quick. I mean, once a hormone is secreted, it basically responds to, you have some kind of response within seconds. Then there is a duration of response difference between nervous system and endocrine system. The uh, nervous system is also very, because it is fast, the duration of the response is also much quicker. In other words, it doesn't last very long. Um, that acetylcholine that goes into the synapse, you know, gets used up in milliseconds. And uh, the endocrine system is much faster. Um, once a hormone gets released, you know, it's in your system for minutes, hours, and even days. 
Now, there's four categories of chemicals we need to talk about. First of all, note the term up here, chemical messenger. Uh, it is a chemical that's secreted that basically carries some kind of message for communication. And so there's four categories we need to talk about. Number one is what's called an autocrine chemical messenger. Uh, notice the prefix auto means self. And so these are chemicals that get secreted by cell in the little diagram here. You've got a cell, it secretes a chemical, um, and it has a localized effect on the exact same cell or cell type. And so in the diagram, you have a, you have a cell here, it produces some kind of chemical, and it doesn't travel very far. It's a, the effects of this chemical are seen directly on the exact same cell type or perhaps even its own cell. So for example, WBC, that's my abbreviation for white blood cell. Um, when you have, uh, when white blood cells uh, detect some kind of infection, they can release a chemical that stimulates their own cells and other cells, other white blood cells right around them to go through cell division and divide so that you can have a bigger immune type reaction. So these are autocrine chemicals. Now, kind of the opposite, I guess, of autocrine is paracrine. Para uh, means other in this case. And so you have chemicals here um, that get released by cell, but it, its effects, the effects of these chemicals are felt by other cell types. They're still very close in proximity. So in other words, these chemicals haven't traveled anywhere very far. They just get released and they're in the same organ or something and uh, their effects are felt by um, a different cell type. So this is a paracrine type mechanism. The example here, you don't necessarily need to know all of the examples for now, but the example here is that inside of the pancreas, and we'll talk about this later um, in the chapter, there's a chemical um, called somatostatin. It gets released, but it doesn't travel. It just stays inside of the pancreas, and it causes other cells called beta cells to slow down and inhibit the production of insulin. The third type um, that we'll talk about um, is, uh, I think I mentioned there were four, there's actually three that this textbook kind of goes over. The third type here is uh, what's called a, a hormone, and that's gonna be our focus really for the remainder of the chapter. Um, your book calls these the classic endocrine system. Some, some textbooks um, have a fourth category, and that's because they separate out neurotransmitters as a separate uh, chemical messenger, but your textbook kind of combines all of these together, which is fine. The main idea here is that these hormones, uh, by definition, a hormone goes directly into the bloodstream. It gets secreted by an endocrine-type cell. It produces a chemical. Um, it goes through diffusion. That chemical goes directly into the bloodstream where it travels and it finds a target cell. And so its effects, the effects of this chemical are felt usually in a distant cell. And we'll talk about many different examples. I've listed a few for you. Epinephrine, maybe you've heard of most of these. Epinephrine, insulin, growth hormones, sex hormones. These are all examples of hormones that follow this definition. Uh, on the right side, this is actually a, a nerve cell, a neuron that's secreting uh, a hormone. And so some neurons can secrete hormones. Um, and so that would be called a neurohormone. And we'll talk about two main types of neurohormones a little bit later. So in figure 16.2, it kind of outlines all three of these for you. This is a good little figure to study to kind of give you a summary of each one of these. And to continue our discussion on hormones, we need to um, uh, look at two different classes of hormones based on their, uh, basically their chemical structure. And so some hormones are considered to be amino acid based. And so if you remember, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And so uh, these are amino acid based. These are usually water soluble. Another way, another definition or a vocabulary word for water soluble is hydrophilic. And because they are water soluble, that means they won't go through the plasma membrane of a cell very easily. So in the little picture here, it's showing you basically an outline of a cell. Here's the cell membrane. Remember, this is a lipid bilayer. It's two layers of lipids. So a 
water-based molecule doesn't want to go through that lipid uh, bilayer. And so therefore, it's going to require a receptor um, to bind to this hormone on the outside of this membrane. The other class is called a steroid hormone or steroid-based hormone. It's basically a lipid. And um, many times these are based on cholesterol type molecules. Now this is not saying that cholesterol is a hormone. This is saying that, that um, the steroid based hormones um, are formed from cholesterol type molecules. And so this is, uh, these are lipid soluble. They're also referred to as hydrophobic. And because they are lipid soluble, this hydrophobic hormone molecule can go through, it can diffuse directly across this plasma membrane. Therefore, when it looks for its receptor to bind to, it's going to find it inside of the cell and usually inside of the nucleus. So um, this figure that I'm showing you here is, um, has a lot of information here. Uh, it's a little complicated at first, but if you draw your attention just to the top portion, um, this is trying to show you how water, the kind of the mechanism behind water-soluble hormones. So here's a blood vessel, and you've got some kind of endocrine cell here. This endocrine cell makes some kind of hormone. In this case, it's a water-soluble hydrophilic hormone. Um, that water-soluble hormone makes its way into the bloodstream, all right? And it travels. It travels through the bloodstream, and then eventually it comes out of the bloodstream, it diffuses out, and it finds its target cell, and there is a receptor that that hormone has to bind to to have some kind of action and it's gonna to bind to this target cell's receptor, which is located on the membrane. On the bottom half, you have a cell here that's an endocrine cell producing a lipid-soluble hormone or a hydrophobic type hormone. In this case, you see this hydrophobic hormone uh, diffusing into the bloodstream, but because it's lipid-soluble, it doesn't travel very easily inside of your blood, and that's because a lot of the blood is plasma, and that plasma is made out of mostly water. And so this lipid-soluble hormone has to have something there to help carry it through the bloodstream. And so what happens is you have proteins, certain types of proteins in the blood that will bind to pick up these hormones, these hydrophobic hormones. They'll pick these up, bind to them, and then that allows them to travel easier through the bloodstream. Eventually, they will diffuse back out of the bloodstream, they'll, they'll locate their target cell, and they will diffuse across the membrane where they will find a receptor either in the cytoplasm or in the inside of the nucleus. And this, is, this diagram is showing a nuclear receptor. And so lipid-soluble hormones a lot of times are called bound hormones because they, they have to bind to a protein uh, inside of the blood to be carried. Water-soluble hormones are usually called, many times are called free hormones because they don't have to have a, they don't require a, a protein to be carried throughout the bloodstream. And then in general, the mechanism is also kind of shown here. Um, and a couple of terms up here for you. Uh, specificity, that means that hormones have to have a specific receptor in order to bind to. There must be a receptor for a hormone, a specific receptor for a hormone to bind to. Otherwise, if it doesn't bind, there is no change of the cell. There is no cell um, action. And then the receptor again is either going to be on the membrane or it's going to be inside of the cell. And so um, usually that's, you know, if you have a lipid soluble hormone again, if, the, if it's lipid soluble, the hormone goes directly into the cell, possibly even inside the nucleus. It's going to find its receptor there. In this case, you happen to have a hormone's receptor that's on the membrane, so you know that this hormone here must be a water-soluble type uh, hormone. The binding site is a specific area on the, on the uh, protein receptor here that will bind to the hormone. And the last couple things here about the receptors that we need to mention is uh, that your endocrine cells and your and your target cells can actually regulate uh, 
uh, the number of receptors that they have um, access to. And so that's called sensitivity. You can change the sensitivity to, to the hormone levels. So if you think about it, uh, if you wanted to change you know, a rate of reaction, a hormone reaction, you can either change the amount of hormone that you have, or you can change the amount of receptors that you have. So to make a, a, a cell more sensitive to a particular hormone, you could increase the number of receptors, and that's called upregulation. And so <clears throat> the definition here says stimulus causes an increase in the synthesis or the production of the receptors. And so here you have some kind of cell here, and it actually is showing you uh, how a receptors are being actually made. And so if you compare this cell to the next cell, it's actually making more receptors to put on the membrane. So now the second cell is going to be more sensitive to a hormone. We're, I kind of mentioned the, the example here. You don't need to know the details about the example. We'll look at this uh, much later in the class or in the course, but there's a hormone called FSH, that's follicle stimulating hormone, that causes the ovaries and the female reproductive system to increase the production of the LH receptors. LH is another hormone, and you increase the number of receptors, and so once you increase the number of receptors, that increase, increases the sensitivity to the LH, and eventually that causes ovulation. And so having more LH receptors, even if you don't change the amount of LH hormone, if you have more receptors, then you have a, 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 more, in, uh, a more sensitive type reaction. You can upregulate and the opposite is downregulation. And so to make a, it's, it's again changing the sensitivity. And so to make a cell less sensitive to a hormone, uh, you can either decrease the amount of hormone or you can decrease the number of receptors. And so downregulation is where you decrease um, the amount of receptors that a hormone would bind to. Now, uh, last couple of things about hormones and their actions is uh, the different mechanisms in place um, to, uh, because you have two different classes, you've got hydrophilic hormones and you have hydrophobic hormones. Each category, because of their chemistry, remember the hydrophilic, these are water soluble, they have to have a receptor on the membrane on the outside of the cell. So the way they act is different than a hydrophobic hormone. And so you got two different actions. And so you got a lot of notes up here. I'm not going to read everything there for you, but I do want to go over the picture, which basically goes through each one of these steps. You can see the four or five main steps here. But if you go over the picture, this is figure 16.4 in the textbook. You see a basically an outline of a cell. Here's the cell membrane. It's got a receptor here embedded in the membrane. So this must, you know, this is a receptor for a water-based hormone. All of this down here, this is inside of the cell, that's cytosol. Everything out here is outside of the cell. And so here comes the hormone, it binds to its receptor. That would be the, uh, the binding site of this receptor. It's probably a protein-based receptor. It has inside of the cell, along the periphery, a protein known as a G protein that is, that is attached to this receptor. The G protein is usually inactivated, but whenever the, um, the hydrophilic hormone binds to its receptor, it activates the G protein and actually splits it into different subunits. Now this G protein is basically activated and then it in turn activates a, a type of enzyme that happens to be close by. So you've got a little cascade type reaction taking place whenever this hormone binds to its receptor. G protein is activated, it activates an enzyme, the enzyme drives some internal type reactions. And you have something created called cyclic AMP. This is what's known as a second messenger. The reason that's called a second messenger is because you're basically using a hormone as your first messenger. See, the idea here is that there's information that you're trying to get from the hormone to get the cell to do something. You've got a hormone and you're trying to make this cell you know, um, respond to this hormone. 
Well, to do that, you know, the problem is this water-based hormone can't get inside the cell. So you've got to transmit this information from this hormone outside the cell to something inside the cell. So the hormone would be your first messenger. You're transmitting this through a little cascade reaction to create something called cyclic AMP. That's your second messenger. That's like a hormone inside the cell, but it's not really a hormone. The cyclic AMP, though, does drive forward some reactions and you basically create some proteins. And so now you have the ability for this message, message to travel from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Eventually, we'll talk about, in just a few minutes, we'll talk about how the, uh, the cell now becomes activated and what, what it can do. What does that hormone really cause it to do? So this is the action of a hydrophilic hormone. So what about a hydrophobic hormone? How's that different? Well, remember the chemistry. This is one that doesn't, uh, doesn't have to have its cell membrane on the, uh, its receptor on the cell membrane. So its receptor is gonna be inside of the cell. This is a hydrophobic molecule that can go through the membrane. And so in this case, here's your hormone. There is no receptor on the outside of the cell, so it goes directly through. It's a lipid, so it passes right through where it finds a receptor either in the cytoplasm or perhaps even inside the nucleus. In this picture, it's showing, you it's showing you that it finds a receptor, binds to a receptor in the cytoplasm. Then that whole molecule then goes through a nuclear pore, goes inside of the nucleus where it actually binds to the DNA and it causes your DNA to turn on a gene sequence and that starts a process, maybe you talked about um, trans uh, translation and tr transcription and translation in 168, the process to you know, produce the RNA molecule, then the RNA molecule then produces proteins. And you go through translation, you make the proteins, that takes place at the ribosome. So all of that is going to be taking place. That's the action part here of this hormone. So that's what this slide was talking about. The hormone crosses over the, crosses into the, uh, through the plasma mem membrane, finds its receptor either in the cytosol or the cytoplasm, or the nucleus. It forms a complex. That complex then goes in and, and interacts with the DNA, and that eventually causes some kind of change in protein synthesis. Last thing we'll look at here in this, um, in this part of the video is uh, the effects of hormone actions. This is um, five examples of what hormones can do through these actions, either if it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic, what happens to the cell? Well, sometimes when a hormone binds, it causes the cell to actually secrete some kind of substance. Maybe it, it, you know, it's, it binds to an endocrine cell, uh, a hormone actually binds to another endocrine cell, and that endocrine cell starts to secrete some other chemical. And, um, you know, maybe uh, we'll talk about some different pathways where, for example, the hypothalamus produces a hormone and that goes to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then, you know, releases other hormones. And so we'll talk about how those little pathways work. Sometimes hormone actions activate or block enzymes. Remember that enzymes help usually to speed up reactions. These are catalysts inside of the body. Sometimes hormones cause or inhibit uh, cell division, either mitosis or meiosis. Sometimes hormones either open or close ion channels. And so that can you know, help to control any of the action potentials, uh, the sodium and the potassium that form the, the, the uh, action potentials and the membrane potentials. Sometimes uh, hormones either turn on or turn off gene expression and that's through the, the DNA. Another characteristic of a hormone is its stability, and um, that also goes back to its chemistry. And so it turns out there's a, there's a term up here, a vocabulary word you should know is half-life. A half-life is how much time. It's a measurement of time. It's a measurement of time. How long does it take for a hormone's concentration to be reduced in half? How long does it take for a particular level of a hormone um, to be reduced by half of what you start with. And so it turns out that lipid-soluble hormones generally have a longer half-life. 
they usually remain in the system longer than water-based hormones. Now the last topic here before we move on to the next section is what is regulating the secretion or the release of hormones. And so there's actually three mechanisms in place um, that try to describe how hormone secretion is being regulated. The first one is called hormonal stimuli. In other words, um, the release or the inhibition of a hormone secretion is based on the presence or absence of another hormone. It's a, har it's, a, it's a hormone that causes a release of another hormone. So for example, um, and we'll talk more about some of these examples as we go through, but here is kind of a picture of what's taking place with a hormone called uh, GHRH. This is growth hormone releasing hormone. This comes from the hypothalamus. It's in the bloodstream where it goes to the pituitary gland and it causes a pituitary gland to release another hormone called growth hormone. So the release of GH is caused by another hormone. That's hormonal stimuli. It's a hormonal stimulus. So the presence of the first hormone triggers the release of another hormone, right? The second example is not based on a hormone. It's based on another chemical other than a hormone. So it's called humoral stimulus. And so the definition there is response to the concentration of a certain chemical or ion or molecule in the blood or maybe even the body fluids. And so in this case, the release of this shows you the, uh, the idea of the example is coming from the pancreas. The pancreas produces a hormone called insulin. So the question is, what's causing insulin to be released? Well, in this case, Insulin is being released not because of another hormone, but because of how much glucose there is present in the bloodstream. So as glucose levels go up, as a concentration of the molecule here, as a concentration of glucose goes up, that causes insulin production and release to go up. And so insulin is being secreted, not based on another hormone, but it's being secreted based on the presence of glucose, another chemical. And the last example is called neural stimulus or neural stimuli. Um, it's response to signals from the nervous system. So in some cases, the, <clears throat> a neuron will secrete um, a, uh, uh, a neurotransmitter and that causes the release of other hormones. So in this example, it's showing you a neuron. It's secreting uh, neurotransmitters and those neurotransmitters are causing a, uh, an endocrine cell in the adrenal gland to secrete hormones called epinephrine and norepinephrine. We'll talk about the hormones in this gland a little later, but in this case, it's the nervous system that's causing the release of a hormone. 